next speaker is Dr. Allison Weber. She's become a resident expert in um, multiple myeloma and these types of paraproteinemias. So she's going to talk to you today about where we stand on kidney uh, transplant and multiple myeloma. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm actually very excited to talk about this topic. Um, there has been a lot of excitement uh, with respect to newer therapies for multiple myeloma, um, and that has led to revisiting these patients as candidates for kidney transplantation. I have no disclosures related to this topic. So I'm going to be uh, breaking this talk up into a couple parts. First, I'm going to talk about historical outcomes of, um, of uh, first I'm going to talk about multiple myeloma and ESRD. How do patients with uh, multiple myeloma do on dialysis? Then I'm gonna talk about historical outcomes of patients with ESRD from myeloma with kidney transplantation. I'm gonna do a review of some of the newer therapies for multiple myeloma. I'm gonna go over some case reports for kidney transplant in the era of the modern myeloma therapy, uh, including our own case series. And then I'm gonna talk about patient selection in our protocol for kidney transplant candidates with ESRD for multiple myeloma, and then the optimal maintenance therapy post. The bottom line is we are transplanting these patients now, um, and so I want to give you a little bit of the background um, and, um, and what our protocols are. So how do patients with ESRD from monoclonal gammopathies do on dialysis? So this is a study that was published in CJSON in 2016, and it looked at trends in survival and renal recovery in patients with myeloma or light chain amyloidosis on chronic dialysis. Let me just see if there's a pointer. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this looked at all incident patients registered in the Renal Epidemiology and Information Network registry between 2002 and 2011 with ESRD from either amyloidosis, light chain deposition disease, or cast nephropathy. And it found uh, 1,459 patients, uh, of which 59% works cast nef nephropathy, 18% amyloid, 23% light chain disease. And it followed them for about 13 months, and it controlled uh, it. it compared them to a control population of about 5,000 patients. And what they found was some interesting things. Firstly, death among patients on dialysis, what you can clearly see is that patients with monoclonal gammopathy, so this is all of the patients combined, uh, were dying more on dialysis compared to controls, and that was statistically significant. What you can also see is they are being transplanted much less. So when you look at patients with monoclonal gammopathy, only 2.3% were transplanted versus 20% of the control population. But really interesting is looking at renal recovery. Um, and what you could see is that patients who have ESRD from monoclonal gammopathy had more renal recovery and came off dialysis compared to patients in the control group. So again, just another, um, just a curve to show you uh, that patients with monoclonal gammopathies on dialysis do not do well. The cumulative incidence of death is statistically significantly much higher for patients on dialysis with ESRD from monoclonal gammopathies compared to the control population. This breaks it up based on the histological um, findings, mean, meaning amyloid light chain deposition disease or cast nephropathy, you could see that patients with cast nephropathy die the most or have the worst outcomes compared to the other two groups. Multivariate analysis showed an adjusted hazard ratio of death of 2.18 in patients with monoclonal gammopathy compared with controls. But interestingly, when you look at renal recovery rates, there is a very big difference here. When you look at patients with monoclonal gammopathy who were diagnosed or started dialysis after 2006 compared to before 2006. And when you look at renal recovery, patients who had monoclonal gammopathy after 2006 recovered their renal function statistically significantly more than those with ESRD from monoclonal gammopathy before 2006. And it was similar in this group to controls. Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit. What was the cause of death in patients with monoclonal gammopathy versus controls on dialysis? Cardiovascular disease, statistically significantly higher as the cause of death in controls compared to those with monoclonal gammopathy. Malignancy, obviously, statistically significantly higher as the cause of death for patients with monoclonal gammopathy compared to controls. When you look at what are some of the risk factors for mortality? 
the year in those patients with monoclonal gammopathies on dialysis, the year of renal replacement therapy initiation was protective. The later they started dialysis, the better they did. So we'll think about why that might be in a little bit. Well, how about historically? How did myeloma patients do with a transplant? Well, historically, they didn't do very well. In a retrospective study by this group, which was published in 2004, the outcomes of seven patients with light chain deposition disease who received kidney transplant were reviewed. And the LCDD recurred in five patients after a median of 33 months. One remained on dialysis excuse me, and then four died. So this study concluded that kidney transplantation should not be an option for patients with ESRD for multiple myeloma. This table looks at how did patients, like gathered all the little case uh, reports of patients who had kidney transplantations done after chemotherapy alone. And when I say chemotherapy alone, I mean not with stem cell transplants, which is what is standard of care right now. But this is, again, very old case reports, 75, 81, 83, 89, 96, where the main uh, regimens used were melphalan and prednisone, again, not treated with a stem cell transplant. And these patients did not do very well. Of the 16 patients treated with chemotherapy alone, followed by kidney transplant, six had a relapse of myeloma, one was in partial remission, and at least six died of infectious complications. I do want you to take a look here, though, at the most recent publication with, again, chemotherapy alone, but now using some of the newer agents, Velcade and Decadron, and those patients actually were doing quite well after kidney transplantation. This looks at stem cell transplant and then kidney transplant. These patients did a lot better. And one of, this, of these case series, which I'm going to go into, was our own case series, which looked at four patients with myeloma. They received some of the newer therapies that are now available, stem cell transplant after that, and they did actually quite well with a kidney transplant. So what are the traditional malignancies and kidney transplant guidelines with respect to multiple myeloma. Well, when you look at the different societies, just to give you a little idea here, the black dot means it's absolutely contraindicated, contraindicated for kidney transplantation, and either the different society didn't even comment on it, or it was an absolute contraindication to kidney transplantation. And that was based on the previous experience that we've had with kidney transplantation for ESRD for myeloma. So what are these newer agents that seem to be having an effect? And again, when we think about that initial study where you could see the graphs diverging or the lines diverging from 2006, that's pretty much when these agents were being introduced. Velcade, for example, was introduced around that time. And that is likely the reason why the year of initiation of dialysis was protective. The later, the better they did. And why you saw the increased renal recovery was because of these newer agents that are um, now being routinely used for patients with multiple myeloma. Older regimens typically included vincristine, doxorubicin, or melphalan and prednisone, but these major advances in the last decade have resulted in improved response, disease control, and overall survival. And these new agents include thalidomide, lenalidomide, or revlimid. Ooh, this is now advancing it. Oh, I used the I pressed the wrong thing. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, thalidomide, revlimid, and bortezomib. So what are some of the mechanism of action of some of these myeloma drugs? And I'm really just going to focus on some of the ones that are most commonly used. The immune modulating drugs like thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide uh, are pleomorphic. They have multiple mechanisms of action, but they include immune activation. We'll come back to that in the, in, later in the talk. Proteasome inhibitors like bortezomib, carfilozomib, ixazomib. I'm not even going to try that one. Um, these are, um, endo they um, have endo -reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum stress induced by altered protein metabolism. And then there's some monoclonal antibodies that are very exciting, including the anti-CD38 antibodies, which are on the surface of plasma cells, including daratumumab. So in many randomized phase two and three clinical trials, they looked at induction therapy with bortezomib, which is Velcade, dexamethasone, plus one of these agents. And they found that the rates of near complete remission and complete remission or complete response was as high as 57% in these clinical trials. So the current practice guidelines for myeloma have changed. 
They include abortezomib containing multi-agent injection regimen with three or four agents, a stem cell transplant in transplant eligible patients, and then a maintenance regimen. And with the best regimens in 2018, the proportion of patients achieving a complete response is close to 60%. And when I presented this actually in our nephrology grand rounds, um, one of the hematologists who was present, Dr. Martin, said actually it's closer to 80% now. But a large proportion of these patients remain dialysis dependent and continue to have poor survival and quality of life, which is really contributed to by the ESRD and not so much the myeloma anymore. So we need to revisit transplant in the new era of modern therapy for multiple myeloma. So this was our study. We just looked at a case series. We did a chart review of all patients with myeloma who did get a kidney transplant. We had done a few of them over the years uh, from 2009 to 2015, and we retrospectively reviewed them, and we found the four cases. And this was the follow-up time for the various patients, the creatinine at one year, the GFR at one year, the, pre the, the creatinine at the time the paper was published, the GFR at the time the paper was published. This was their serum-free light chains. One out of the four did have a myeloma recurrence and was treated, but there was no evidence of recurrence in the allograft. All of these patients received living kidney transplants. All had achieved either a very good, this is how hematologists uh, classify uh, response, very good partial remission, which I think is kind of funny, but anyway, I guess, yeah. Um, or complete remission, and they all had chemotherapies that included bortezomib, lenalidomide, or thalidomide, or a combination of these. They all had a stem cell transplant, and three or four of them had maintenance therapy with a single agent. They were all on standard immunosuppression. Minor infectious complications, no CMV or BK, no rejection. Um, one patient did die five years later uh, after the publication of this paper from amyloid, but he did have his kidney transplant for five years and did quite well. So we now have a cohort of 11 patients total with ESRD from light chain deposition disease and cast nephropathy. Seven thus far have been transplanted between 2001 and 2017. Four have been transplanted since April of 2018 when we started really doing these as a protocol. One died, that was the same patient that I talked about in the, the four cases. He had his transplant for five years. One was interestingly just diagnosed with donor-derived urothelial cancer, and he had a transplant nephrectomy in 2018, after his transplant was in 2011. And nine out of 11 are alive with ex excellent renal function. Eight have complete information, because some of them are just fresh transplants. Some have had relapses, but they have been treated for those. And three out of eight are off all medications for multiple myeloma and remain in remission. So who do we transplant, and when do we transplant these patients? What is the ideal timing to transplant patients with ESRD from myeloma? It's very important to remember that compared with other malignancies, all patients with myeloma who survive initial uh, treatment will eventually relapse. The difference is, is that we now have so many new therapies for myeloma that can, can get them back into remission. And unlike other malignancies, where the farther out you are from your diagnosis, the more likely, the less likely you are to relapse. The farther out from your diagnosis and treatment of myeloma, the more likely you are to relapse. So it is better to transplant these patients earlier. Who should we transplant? Well, there's definitely some high risk markers that we may want to avoid and use as a protocol to not transplant them, like high LDH, extramedullary disease, poor performance status, persistent disease after a stem cell transplant. And they now have this mineral uh, residual disease assay, which basically looks for um, an absent aberrant clone of plasma cells by next generation flow cytometry or next generation sequencing on bone marrow aspirates with a minimum sensitivity of one to 10 to the fifth. So it's a very highly sensitive assay that can really detect an aberrant clone. Um, and this is now being used routinely um, to look for evidence of residual disease in a very sensitive, uh, with a very sensitive assay. So this uh, review basically tries to come up with an algorithm of when to transplant these patients. And they look at, they compare three different groups, high risk, multiple myeloma, so some of those other characteristics like LDH or extramedullary disease, 
but uh, with MRD positivity. So even after treatment, they still have this minimal residual disease. We may either want to transplant them later, or we may never want to transplant these people. Then there's a sort of intermediate risk group, high risk myeloma, but MRD negative. So they had a really good response to therapy or a, like a standard risk myeloma, but MRD positive, we might want to wait a year after they've achieved their VGPR or CR. And then the lower risk group, where there are standard uh, risk myeloma and MRD negative, we might want to transplant those patients earlier. This is a very straightforward and easy to follow algorithm <laughs> for how to evaluate a patient uh, with multiple myeloma that we recently made really taking into account any possible range of scenarios that could happen to that particular person. The bottom line is we had to look at what our wait times are when we think patients would be uh, most benefit from a kidney transplant within this group. And it's if you can get them transplanted sooner. So um, we wanna wait a period of time to make sure they're in remission, but if they have a wait time on the list of less than two years, we would consider them for transplantation. And we really wanna push living donor transplants in these patients, because they could get the most benefit from a transplant uh, the sooner they get transplanted once they're in a good remission. Well, what's our current clearance criteria? So I'm gonna go over this uh, very briefly, but they have to have a confirmed, complete, or very good partial remission for one year. About one year is what we've decided for the time being, although some of our hematologists uh, wanna change that. Uh, bone marrow biopsy within tran uh, right before transplantation to ensure that they're still in remission. Our hematologists wanna review their my myeloma labs, clearance by Hemonc, and then we want them to be off of the uh, Revlimid um, for at least for a couple of weeks. We have different guidelines of how long we want them off their maintenance therapy prior to transplantation. This is, of course, in the case of a living donor transplant. And then we want them to, it's okay to restart a proteosome inhibitor and or daratumumab at two to three weeks post-kidney transplant after discussion with us. So why did we choose proteosome inhibitors and daratumumab? Uh, post-kidney transplantation over Revlimid, which is a major uh, therapy that's now being used for myeloma. Two main reasons. One, proteasome inhibitors have been studied for the treatment of antibody-mediated rejection in kidney transplantation, albeit I think it's kind of weak in terms of the research, but they have been used very safely in kidney transplant patients. And two, there is a role for the immune-modulating drugs in rejection, and we're gonna talk about that. So remember, when we target antibodies in transplantation and we treat AMR, we could target uh, different aspects of um, uh, B cells. We could target with anti-CD20 with rituximab. We can target the plasma cell with proteasome inhibitors. And so that's been one therapy that has been used uh, across centers for AMR. So since it happens to be a myeloma therapy and it's been shown to be safe in kidney transplantations, this would be the preferred choice for post-kidney transplantation. So it's been seen used, uh, it's been uh, in case series. This group looked at six patients with mixed ACR AMR, refractory to current therapies. They were treated with bortezomib. It seemed to help reverse the rejection uh, and improve renal function. Um, another study looked at bortezomib and rituximab in addition to the routine therapy for AMR, plasmapheresis, IV, IG, and steroids, and found treat with bortezomib to be partially effective, um, always used in conjunction with other therapies. There's no randomized clinical trials, but it has been used in, in transplantation. Well, what about lenalidomide, which is Revlimid and solid organ transplantation? Well, remember that the mechanism of action of lenalidomide is immune activation. So this is a case report that was published in AJKT in 2017 of a 65-year-old female with ESRD, secondary to PKD, and she had a living unrelated transplant five years and later presented with pathologic fracture and a new diagnosis of myeloma. She was started on therapy with Revlimid and dexamethasone, and she had AKI from a creatinine of 0.9 to 5.9, and a biopsy showed a severe rejection. Our own case uh, similarly happened, 57-year-old woman, ESRD, secondary to immunotactoid, GN, 12 years ago, diagnosed with multiple myeloma, got treated with Revlimid, had a severe rejection, and is actually, I believe, now back on dialysis. So the mechanism of action of these drugs, it's got multiple immunomodulatory effects. It activates T cells by directly inducing tyrosine phosphorylation of CD21. It leads to increased secretion of cytokines like interferon gamma, IL-2, um, also shown to augment NK cell cytotoxicity.
So much like the, so a lot of the new immune, immunomodulatory medications that are being used in cancer therapies, these have posed a, a very big risk for kidney transplant patients. So the new agents for myeloma, for, uh, excuse me, for melanoma, for example, like ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody, nivolumab, these we've had patients who've had uh, a kidney transplant, then develop a myeloma, and then the um, oncologist wants to treat them with a PD-1 inhibitor, which we know is going to activate the immune system. And so these, just like that, lenalidomide is, is a problem for kidney transplant patients because its mechanism of action is immune activation. So in summary, patients with myeloma and ESRD do very poorly on dialysis. Historically, myeloma was a contraindication to transplantation. Newer therapies, including stem cell transplants, as well as several new agents, have vastly improved the prognosis of patients with myeloma, and estimates that optimally treated up to 60 to 80% of patients will achieve a complete remission. Case series have demonstrated acceptable outcomes for patients with myeloma and kidney transplantation in this new era. Since almost all patients with myeloma will relapse, timing and patient selection are crucial for patients to realize the potential benefit of kidney transplantation. Management of kidney transplant patients with myeloma require a cohesive team of oncologists and nephrologists to optimize outcomes. Thank you very much. Tui was my fellow at the time, and Jeff and Tom Martin. Happy to answer any questions. Yes, Peter. I just uh, asked my sister as a hematologist in Chicago. She just literally sent me an email. She literally sent me an email just now asking me if um, we would consider, she has a patient that has polycystic kidney disease um, that has a chron CLL. Um, okay. And uh, she thinks that um, she can control um, the CLL, and I know we've had a couple of we cases have. of that. Yes. Would you be willing to move forward with transplant in that setting? Yes, we have before. How many times have we done that? I have no idea, but I can tell you I've taken care of some patients with CLL. Great, thanks. So I'm, I'm guessing the answer to this is going to be it's just too soon to begin talking about it, but I wondered if you had any thoughts about um, the new CAR-T therapy that's coming out for multiple myeloma and how that might affect um, patients with ESRD. That's a great question. I knew that was going to be asked. Um, so I'm actually meeting on Monday with the hematology group again to review this because they're very excited about CAR-T therapy. And I have to have a, a more thorough understanding of how it works because as long as it's very targeted, I think it should be okay. But the concern about CAR-T therapy, again, is immune activation and whether it's going to have more than just targeting the actual myeloma cells itself, whether it could have effects elsewhere and be a problem post-kidney transplantation. But that is a very good question, and that's what I've been asked repeatedly. And I'm meeting with the oncologist on Monday, actually, to go over the different types of CAR-T therapy, because there's multiple different targets for the CAR-T therapy that are, that are going to become available. And having an, an understanding of uh, you know, I, it, there have definitely been some reports of cytokine storm, for example, after CAR T therapy. Is that going to, that could potentially have ill effects for a kidney transplant, obviously. So I need to know a little bit more about it before we go forward with CAR-T therapy in our patients. One of the dilemmas I'm having with the oncologist is they're so excited, they want to transplant, they wanted to give a kidney transplant to everybody. They're like, there's so many therapies coming out. I keep trying to explain that some of those therapies are not going to be available. And in other words, they're saying, well, some of the therapies we can give now are going to be much better with normal renal function. We can actually dose them better with normal renal function. And we have this huge armamentarium of agents, but we have to weigh that against the risk that some of those agents they won't be able to use post-kidney transplant. And is that going to put their patient at risk of uh, a refractory myeloma that would, we would have a very challenging time treating after transplant? So it's a real balance, but it's really fascinating as far as I'm concerned. And I think uh, thus far I can tell you, um, some of the, one patient we just had a, had a relapse, so this is not a very straightforward, easy group to manage. But um, if you have a cohesive team and you work together and, you could, and we could kind of pick the agents that we want, again, I always want to get... The, the, um, there's some newer oral agents that are uh, um, proteasome inhibitors. So Velcade is sub-Q, um, but Ixazomib is one of the newer oral agents. And so the, the Revlimid is oral as well. So I'm trying to get more people on Ixazomib and off Revlimid post-transplant. 
Another interesting thing is not everybody on Revlimid actually rejects their kidney transplants. So it's, there's definitely cases, but I have a patient who's maintained on Revlimid and actually doing okay. So it's, it's a very interesting topic and very challenging. That's a great question. Lately, we have been seeing more cases of MGRS with renal failure who don't have mm. quite all the manifestations of myeloma. Right. So the questions are, should these people be aggressively treated with chemo if they have advanced renal failure in preparation for transplant? Right. Although their kidneys have failed, and uh, do they, any information at all, do they do as well as MGUS, or do they behave more like myeloma? That's a great question. So um, we've had a couple cases of smoldering myeloma actually come uh, with ESRD, um, not thought to be related to the smoldering myeloma. I don't think that they, their biopsy did not show that it was related. Um, and the question is, what do we do with those patients? Because unlike MGUS, which has a very low rate of transformation into myeloma, smoldering and MR MGRS has a higher rate of transformation into myeloma. And so if you transplant them, so in some cases, what our oncologists have suggested is actually treating them like their myeloma before a transplant. So do I have any experience with it? No, we actually have not gone forward thus far because the decision of the one patient that came forward was smoldering. I think there were other comorbidities and we decided not to transplant him. Um, but if another smoldering comes up um, and, uh, and they're okay from, from a transplant perspective, what our oncologists have suggested is actually treating them like a myeloma where they otherwise may have just observed them. Would you mind re-summarizing or shortly, in a myeloma patient on yeah. dialysis, that what would be some of the, just the key elements where you say, okay, we're ready to try bone marrow transplant? Uh, well, I don't make the decision about the auto, the auto stem cell transplants. It's, it's when we make a decision to give them a kidney transplant. No. Um, when do they give them at all? Oh, so there, there's well, some, there, sorry, I think yeah, that yeah, yeah, no, it's I'm this. Sorry. Correct. When in the course of, just, I know you had a really complicated yeah. thing, but when in the course of treatment of myeloma do you consider these are enough remission criteria to say we can go ahead? So right now our criteria is they have to have had induction ther chemotherapy, a stem cell transplant, have a bone marrow biopsy that shows they're in very good partial remission, which is based on I don't know, something, you know, percentage of plasma cells, et cetera, or higher, or a complete remission. They have to be maintained on a therapy and in that VGPRCR for one year, and then we transplant them. That's our current criteria. It might change to less than that, which is what the oncologists are pushing for. They want like six months, but it depends on the qualities of the myeloma. Are they a high-risk myeloma patient with a high risk of relapse? Are they a, a lower or standard risk myeloma patient? Choose any particular type of immunosuppression. Looking at the numbers of people done, which is huge, but do you get some protection from the immune activating agents? Because we've seen patients given that for other cancers that develop renal disease. I've treated a couple with prednisone and stuff without backing off the agent, and the kidney disease, when caught very early, quiets down. You're, you're, so you're asking me, does some of the immunosuppression counteract the activity of Revlimid, for example, the immune activation? You, you would think it would. Uh, sadly, there are other case reports of heart transplant patients who developed myeloma and got treated. All of our patients, all these patients that got rejection were on standard immunosuppression. So it was not as protective, it was not protective ultimately in those particular patients. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs>